Good morning. Heavy stuff for 8 o'clock in the morning. So uh, hopefully you've all had enough coffee. What I'm going to talk about is sort of the end of the continuum of the uh, development and the progress of coronary artery disease as uh, sort of um, stylized in this uh, graphic here where we see the uh, development of the plaque, ultimately plaque rupture and, and thrombosis. And as you know, the diagnosis of ST elevation MI uh, is an important one to make early on because it defines the acute therapy and to distinguish that from non-ST elevation acute coronary syndromes. I won't be talking about non-ST elevation. Uh, that's a, a topic of another lecture. Uh, but if you recall, the important issues are that these are really uh, the same process, but just, just different degrees of severity. Uh, most ST elevation MIs represent complete occlusion of a coronary vessel, and uh, left alone to the natural history will progress to Q-wave myocardial infarction. But due to endogenous processes of thrombolysis or collaterals or reasons we don't completely understand, some would not. Uh, and so there's a fair amount of overlap between what ultimately happens in a patient who has an ST elevation MI or a non-ST elevation MI. And much of the pathophysiology uh, and the treatment is similar, although there are important differences. I present the data, uh, and, and then I present the recommendations. And I do so uh, according to the uh, ACCHA guidelines, which are also used by many other bodies, uh, which uh, uh, divide their guidelines according to 1, 2A, 2B, <coughs> and 3. Uh, 1 is a strong recommendation. Uh, 2A and 2B are representative of uh, lesser degrees of recommendation on less data, and 3 is actually a contraindication. Uh, and then uh, also you'll see uh, levels of evidence within each of these A, B, and C, uh, which are uh, based upon uh, whether or not there are multiple trials or uh, a few trials or uh, observational data. Uh, but the bottom line is that a one recommendation is uh, uh, established as useful and effective and strongly recommended and then supportive or uh, some degree of disagreement but probably consensus. I'll divide the talk uh, according to uh, the following. First, talk briefly about initial management. Focus importantly on reperfusion therapy and adjunctive antithrombotic therapy. Focus on some of the evidence-based adjunctive medical therapies. And finally, touch very briefly, because that alone is an entire lecture, on the issue of complications. First, initial evaluation. Uh, in terms of evidence-based medicine, there are only a few strong recommendations for initial evaluation. Uh, recognizing the importance, <coughs> pardon me, of time to therapy <coughs> and not delaying that time to therapy with extensive evaluations that do not contribute to immediate management. And so a targeted history is the key, focusing on um, symptoms uh, which may represent other causes of chest discomfort or on important comorbidities which may contraindicate antithrombotic or fibrinolytic therapy. <clears throat> also, a targeted physical exam, again, to determine if patients having a stroke, for example, if they're in heart failure, if there's evidence of aortic dissection, et cetera. That, this also uh, leads into the issue of neurologic exam uh, because strokes can uh, accompany myocardial infarction either as the triggering event or as a result of embolization. And of course, 12 lead ECG, which makes the diagnosis of ST elevation myocardial infarction and performed and interpreted as a benchmark within 10 minutes uh, of arrival. This is a quality indicator. Uh, again, the targeted history, the elements include uh, uh, whether or not patients have known coronary disease, uh, either with uh, symptoms or uh, revascularization procedures, uh, the description of the chest discomfort, uh, whether or not they've got important risk factors, uh, and again, the issues related to aortic dissection or stroke, and risk factors for bleeding. Similarly, for the physical examination, the ABCs, um, whether or not a patient is in impending or overt shock uh, or uh, heart failure, and again, whether or not there's signs of stroke or a loss of pulses consistent with aortic dissection. It's important to recognize that it, with only a very few variables, you can uh, get a fairly good idea of the patient's risk, and this is the so-called gusto pyramid. And it turns out that five major factors constitute about 90 plus percent uh, of the information regarding the uh, overall risk of a patient for short and long-term complications. And those include advanced age, a, a, a fall in systolic blood pressure, kill up class greater than one, uh, tachycardia greater than um, um, uh, 100, or an anterior myocardial infarction. And if you sum up these percentages, they end up being about uh, 85 to 90 percent of the total predictive value for risk. And so these simple factors really can give you an idea of which patients are at highest risk. Reperfusion therapy is the cornerstone and the reason why uh, it is important to make the initial discrimination between ST elevation and non-ST elevation ACS. 
It's based upon the five placebo-controlled landmark trials of fibrinolytic agents in patients with acute myocardial infarction, showing uh, with streptokinase, uh, APSAC, or anastreptolase, which is no longer available, and an old uh, uh, regimen of Altaplace or TPA, that uh, reductions in uh, mortality by 30 days of as much as 30 percent could be achieved, particularly in patients treated within the first six hours. And this benefit was maintained over the long term. Now, um, uh, some of these studies were quite large and enrolled a, a heterogeneous population of patients, and so pooling of all the studies by the fibrinolytic therapy trialists allow us to get a better idea of which patients do and do not benefit uh, from fibrinolytic therapy, at least on a consistent or population basis. Um, and the results showed very clearly that patients, uh, as expected with ST elevation, particularly anterior but also inferior, uh, had a reduction in events. But importantly, and perhaps somewhat unexpectedly, patients with bundle branch block. This is bundle branch block not known to be old, so in many cases you couldn't prove it was new, but not known to be old, uh, also benefit. And in fact, those patients with bundle branch block, because it often represents an anterior infarction, a large one, actually have the highest overall risk. Uh, and so this is an important uh, group of patients to treat. Uh, in contrast, though, patients with ST depressions uh, or patients with other T-wave abnormalities or patients who had what appeared to be normal ECGs did not benefit from fibrinolytic therapy. So this form of early reperfusion therapy is confined to those with ST elevations or those with bundle branch block not known to be old. Of course, the most feared complication of fibrinolytic therapy, which defines in part the uh, uh, indications, is the risk of intracranial hemorrhage, which in over 80 percent of patients who suffer intracranial hemorrhage in the setting of fibrinolysis is associated with death or severe disability, so is essentially equivalent uh, to, to a death in most cases. Uh, and uh, intracranial hemorrhage rates in a variety of trials have ranged from 0.3 to 0.4 percent with streptokinase to as high as 0.7 to 1 percent with more aggressive fibrinolytic regimens, although it's generally accepted to be now in the range of 0.4 to 0.6 percent with modified heparin dosing, uh, as we'll talk about uh, later on in this lecture. And so this is the risk that we are most concerned about, and thus it defines the absolute contraindications, or what are felt to be absolute. Uh, which really relate primarily to risk for intracranial hemorrhage. That is a prior intracranial hemorrhage, a neoplasia, vascular lesion, other structural abnormalities, uh, recent ischemic stroke within the last three months, head trauma within the last three months, and then uh, other issues, active bleeding, but not menses. That's been looked at in many subgroups, uh, or uh, suspected aortic dissection for obvious reasons. Now, relative contraindications are also, in many cases, those which have been associated, although not as strongly, with the risk of intracranial hemorrhage. And one of the uh, uh, key ones is uncontrolled blood pressure. That is, any reliable measurement of blood pressure at any time, even if controlled during that presentation, of greater than 180 systolic or 110 diastolic. And this often ends up being a question. Um, so uh, an unreliable by a bystander, for example, is not the issue, but if a paramedic measures 180 over 110 and then they're controlled in the ER, it's still a contraindication, a relative contraindication. And then others, severe uncontrolled hypertension, prior, uh, old CVAs uh, or other endocranial hemorrhages, recent bleeding, uh, a traumatic or prolonged CPR, not a brief period of CPR, other surgery, uh, a, a warfarin therapy with an INR that's elevated, uh, pregnancy or peptic ulcer disease. Now, the alternative form, of course, of, of uh, reperfusion is a mechanical reperfusion by PCI, or percutaneous coronary intervention. And the, the type of uh, therapy, be it balloon stent or drug eluting stent, has evolved over time and is less relevant. But what is the key is that in the randomized trials, particularly when pooled, there's been clear evidence of better outcome with mechanical reperfusion as compared to fibrinolytic reperfusion. And that's against uh, streptokinase or fibrin specific uh, uh, with regard to death, reinfarction, uh, and uh, certain certainly lower rates of a stroke, particularly intracranial hemorrhage. One of the key issues is time to therapy, though. Uh, and so it's uh, notable, though, that in, in cases where uh, processes are fast and well uh, developed for transfer of patients who present to hospitals that don't have PCI facilities to those that do, uh, as shown in this meta-analysis of the transfer trials, it was still better to transfer for PCI than for fibrinolysis. Nevertheless, it is important to recognize that, again, these were efficient centers, uh, particularly in Europe and smaller countries, uh, where uh, uh, these, uh, these transfer times were often very short. And there is no question that the time to therapy is important. And it's been estimated that for every 30-minute delay, there's about a 7 percent increase in the risk of mortality. 
uh, over the uh, relative risk of mortality, uh, as, as shown here in this curve. And so uh, the recommendations really reflect this for patients who present with acute myocardial infarction. That is, if available within 90 minutes, PCI is recommended over fibrinolytic therapy. But if a patient presents to a hospital without PCI capability, and he cannot be transferred to undergo PCI within 90 minutes of first medical contact, not 90 minutes of, of, of getting to that hospital, but from the time the clock starts when they show up at the first hospital, then they should receive rapid fibrinolytic therapy. And so uh, this is the current uh, uh, recommendations. Now, the question then of what happens for patients who fail fibrinolysis is uh, reflected in the data for so-called rescue PCI. And a number of trials have been carried out, none of which are very large, but the, the pooled results essentially show that in patients who appear to have failure of, of, piece, of, of fibrinolytic therapy, there is a benefit in terms of mortality uh, and in the development of heart failure all, uh, and reinfarction, although at a uh, somewhat increased risk of bleeding of uh, sending a patient then for rescue PCI. Uh, certain subgroups are at higher risk. Patients who are in uh, shock uh, also have a, uh, a particular benefit from uh, re reperfusion. This is even if they are in shock outside of the typical 6 to 12 hour window. Uh, and in the largest trial, the shock trial, uh, the uh, uh, overall result was a reduction in mortality. There was a question of whether or not that benefit was present in older patients, although a registry suggested that it probably was, uh, so it's unclear. But overall, shock is considered an, edu uh, an indication for revascularization. And so rescue patients or rescue therapy is indicated in any patients who have cardiogenic shock, particularly if they're under 75 years of age with a strong in, uh, uh, recommendation or hemodynamic uh, compromise. But notice, even for patients greater than 75 years, recognizing that uh, that was probably not a real finding, they recommend for cardiogenic shock, hemodynamic instability, or failed lysis. And the best measurement that we have is a less than 50 percent resolution of ST elevations on uh, EKG after fibrinolytic therapy. Now, even a more aggressive approach has recently become investigated and is becoming uh, accepted as a standard of care, and that is routine transfer of high-risk patients uh, at, who show up at hospitals uh, rather than waiting to see if they develop symptoms of shock or if they develop symptom, symptoms of failed fibrinolysis. And two trials, the Caressin AMI uh, and the Transfer AMI trial, in 600 patients and about uh, uh, 1,100 patients respectively, examine the question of whether or not high-risk patients, and the criteria for high risk were similar but not identical, but whether high risk patients who show up at centers that do not have PCI facilities and then receive fibrinolytic therapy, either full dose tenecteplase or in this case half retoplase plus abciximab, who receive fibrinolytic therapy then benefit from routine transfer for immediate PCI or immediate catheterization to a hospital after their fibrinolytic therapy or should be transferred only if they show evidence of a problem. Either they didn't reperfuse, they continue to have chest pain, they go into shock, they have heart failure, et cetera. And so these two, uh, both in similar ways, examined that question. Uh, patients who went to the immediate transfer arms underwent PCI about 85% of the time. Interestingly, depending upon how the trial went, uh, 30 to 60% of patients in the conservative arms ultimately underwent PCI, but here at a median of 3 to 33 hours as compared to 2 to 3 hours. And so it was a much, in many ways, a trial of routine very early PCI after fibrinolytic therapy versus delaying it uh, and doing it uh, in select group of patients, and both of them showed the same thing. That is, the uh, rates of ischemic complications were much lower uh, in patients who uh, underwent immediate transfer for PCI and catheterization after receiving fibrinolytic <laughs> therapy, and in both cases without a cost of increased bleeding. And so in the current era, high-risk patients are considered uh, the, uh, the, the approaches to uh, uh, um, triage and transfer. And the newest update of the American Heart Association, which is 2009, so, uh, made it very clear that it's important to have systems of care which include transfer protocols within communities and are recommended with a fairly high level of, uh, of um, confidence transfer of high-risk patients immediately after lysis to PCI facilities uh, and even to consider transfer with a lower level uh, of non-high-risk patients. Adjunctive antithrombotic therapy has emerged as a very important way of optimizing the outcome of uh, both the early PCI as well as preventing uh, reperfusion, uh, uh, sorry, reocclusion. 
Aspirin has been the mainstay of therapy since the definitive trial, ISIS-2, in 16,000 patients, randomized patients to aspirin, streptokinase, the combination, or neither in the setting of acute myocardial infarction, showed unquestionably that aspirin reduced the risk of mortality to an extent similar to that of fibrinolytic therapy. And the combination was uh, an additive effect. And so these are considered uh, to standard of care. It's a class one level of evidence A, the highest possible recommendation for aspirin routinely in all patients except those who are allergic with acute myocardial infarction. Initial dose uh, a little higher if they're not on therapy and then a maintenance dose. Now, clopidogrel has emerged, obviously, in many settings of ischemic heart disease, an important agent. In the setting of ST elevation MI, the data is relatively limited, but is extrapolated to a great extent from the CURE trial, which was non-ST elevation ACS. Nevertheless, there are two trials. One was Clarity, uh, a relatively small trial. These are patients undergoing fibrinolysis. But in this trial, uh, adding uh, clopidogrel with an initial 300 milligram loading dose uh, reduced the risk of ischemic complications and improved uh, uh, infarct vessel patency. And in a larger trial, the COMMIT trial, uh, 75 milligrams a day in, uh, carried out primarily in China without a loading dose, uh, again, uh, the addition of clopidogrel was associated with a reduction in ischemic complications as well as a significant reduction in mortality itself. Now, an important distinction between these trials is that the CLARITY trial, which had a loading dose, did not include patients over 75 years of age whereas the COMMIT trial, which did not have a loading dose, did not have an age limit. And so there remained this unknown in terms of how safe it is to give elderly patients a loading dose of clopidogrel if they've received fibrinolysis, and so the guidelines reflect this. More data with uh, uh, theanopyridines has been uh, obtained now with prasugrel, a stronger uh, inhibitor of uh, the ADP uh, receptor on platelets. And in this trial, which was a broad trial of patients with ACS undergoing PCI, all of them undergoing PCI, the prasugrel instead of clopidogrel was associated with reduction in ischemic complications, although overall a significant increase, although of lesser magnitude, in the risk of bleeding complications. The ST elevation MI subgroup of that trial was quite large, 3,500 patients. This is larger than most many other trials of, of MI itself. And in that group, most of whom underwent primary PCI, although some were undergoing PCI later, you could see that there was about a 30% reduction in ischemic complications, including a reduction in mortality was statistically significant, and, and at a risk of bleeding that was not appreciably increased in what are generally younger patients than those with non-ST elevation. So the guidelines recommend uh, uh, the uh, use of clopidogrel uh, with a bolus, Prasugrel uh, now somewhat preferred over clopidogrel given the uh, better data, although uh, there is a contraindication in patients who've had a prior CVA or TIA considered an absolute contraindication to prasugrel. In patients not uh, undergoing PCI but not primary, uh, and those who've had prior lysis, uh, clopidogrel uh, uh, or, or prasugrel are considered, uh, uh, I'm sorry, uh, clopidogrel is considered uh, treatment. Um, and um, if they've not received uh, a uh, uh, fibrinolysis, then uh, to load the dose, uh, representing the, the risk of bleeding or uh, reflecting the concern of risk of bleeding. Now, GP2B3 inhibitors were uh, a major part of therapy uh, uh, in the last decade, although with the newer agents that are available, uh, the question of incremental benefit has become um, uh, important. Nevertheless, the current guidelines still consider uh, 2B3 blockade to be important, uh, at least as an alternative. And so these are based primarily on the data for Ipsiximab, although there are uh, smaller data sets with the other two agents as well. And, and basically, these, these agents showed that in the setting of primary PCI, um, that there was a reduction in ischemic complications with both stenting and with balloon angioplasty. Now, what has not panned out with fibrinolytic agents is the concept of so-called facilitated PCI, and that is in a patient who's going to go for PCI but may have a, a period of delay to give fibrinolytic agents or a fibrinolytic agent with abciximab or, some, or abciximab alone ahead of time to so-called reperfuse in some cases uh, and then uh, hopefully result in a better outcome when they ultimately come to PCI. And in the largest trial that was carried out, but the meta-analysis is similar, uh, there was no benefit to giving uh, abciximab um, uh, by itself or abciximab with half-dose retoplase ahead of time as compared to just giving abciximab at the time of primary PCI. And giving it ahead of time, particularly giving it with a fibrinolytic agent, was associated with increased bleeding. So the routine use 
of facilitated PCI cannot be recommended. And so the recommendations do call it a fairly high level for abcixumab at the time of PCI, a slightly lower uh, level but still acceptable for up to five of tyro, uh, tyrofibam, and facilitated is considered now not something to be used. Uh, the usefulness is uncertain. Uh, it's not overtly contraindicated, but it's the lowest level of um, recommendation. Other uh, uh, antithrombotic agents, of course, include the, uh, those agents directed at the soluble coagulation cascade, the traditional agent for which has been heparin, although recognize we have very little data showing eff efficacy of heparin. Uh, this was a, a drug that was essentially grandfathered in in a period where we didn't require the same evidence base. And only a number of relatively small trials in the setting of, uh, of uh, fibrinolytic therapy. You can see the numbers here and the denominators are very small. And in general, they show a fairly marginal benefit, particularly in patients who are also receiving aspirin, but it consistently an increased risk of bleeding complications for fibrinolytic therapy. Moving to lower molecular weight heparins is also, although large trials have been carried out, been associated with an uncertain benefit. Uh, in the extract TIMI-25 trial, uh, no substitution of anoxaparin was associated with a decreased risk of ischemic complications, but it was entirely in reinfarction, no increase, no decrease in the risk of mortality. And the difference was uh, only during the period of prolonged anoxaparin out to as long as eight days uh, as compared to the 48-hour infusion of unfractionated heparin. And anoxaparin was associated with an increased risk of bleeding complications, although not intracranial hemorrhage. And so the uncertainty here of benefit, particularly if a patient's going to go for PCI, uh, remains the case. Similarly, although Fonda Paranox has had a very clear uh, evidence base in non-ST elevation um, um, myocardial infarction, in ST elevation in the OASIS-6 trial, it was a sort of confusing trial that had different strata depending upon whether or not there was or was not an indication for underlying heparin therapy. But compared to um, no underlying heparin, that is placebo, uh, Fonda Paranox was associated with what appeared to be a reduction in ischemic complications less so in patients who had an indication for heparin, but importantly, in patients who uh, went for primary PCI, which was, again, a fairly large subgroup of patients, no benefit of fondoparanox, and an increased risk of thrombotic complications in the guide catheter or within the coronary artery itself when fondoparanox was given rather than unfractionated heparin. So in general, for patients who are early or, late or later destined to undergo PCI, fondoparanox is not particularly indicated. Uh, and and if it has been given, patients also need heparin at the time they go to PCI. And so the anticoagulant guidelines are unfractionated heparin or noxaparin. And the data for noxaparin that showed a reduction in uh, reinfarction favors that over unfractionated heparin with fibrinolytic therapy. And there are the ranges uh, are, are provided here with a caveat for uh, reduction for age and renal function. Fondoparanox is also recommended, but if patients are undergoing PCI, then they'll need to have an additional anticoagulation with an antithrombin agent at that time. Bivalirudin is a direct thrombin inhibitor, which has been used in the broad spectrum of patients undergoing PCI. Uh, in the setting of fibrinolysis, it provided no benefit. But in the setting of PCI, uh, in the trial of acute ST elevation myocardial infarction, it provided equivalent protection against ischemic events compared to heparin plus 2B3A and about a 45% reduction in bleeding complications. Uh, and so uh, uh, bivalirudin in the latest update now has been included as uh, uh, an option for patients undergoing to primary PCI, bivalirudin, uh, regardless of whether or not they've had prior unfractionated heparin, um, um, and then uh, alternatively to give unfractionated heparin with 2B3. So these are considered options with a little bit favoring bivalirudin, uh, uh, and then a particular uh, uh, in patients undergoing high risk for bleed, or with at high risk for bleeding given the reduction in bleeding complications. Now, other adjunctive medical therapies have a smaller database in terms of evidence uh, with large trials of benefit with uh, uh, myocardial infarction, in part because the antithrombotic agents have been a more recent addition in an era where we've required large-scale trials. Um, and so it's interesting that many of the agents that we use routinely and do not have as strong of a database. And one of the prime examples for that is beta blockers. We've used beta blockers for years, but only recently in the reperfusion era have we had evidence of a mortality benefit uh, with beta blockers and under particular circumstances with particular caveats. 
Um, in uh, 2001, the uh, uh, Capricorn trial was published in which carvedilol in patients who had large infarctions, that is ejection fractions less than 40%, uh, uh, were found to have a reduction in mortality and reinfarction of the combination with carvedilol as compared to placebo. This is relatively recent. We'd certainly been using beta blockers for the longest time, but this was the first large-scale evidence of uh, uh, mortality reduction and with a particular agent in a particular group of patients. More recently, the Chinese in the COMMIT trial that I showed you earlier for the theanopyridine also had an arm of randomization to beta blockers. Here in 45,000 patients, giving a drug in a way that we've given it for years, IV, three times five milligrams IV in the emergency room, five minutes apart, followed by up to 200 milligrams daily versus placebo. In that trial, giving a beta blocker uh, resulted in no significant difference uh, very surprisingly, in the composite endpoint of death, reinfarction, uh, or, or, or other cardiac arrest. And so uh, a, a subgroup analysis illustrated why that might be, demonstrating that although deaths due to reinfarction were reduced, deaths due to, I'm sorry, reinfarction and ventricular fibrillation were reduced, deaths due to, this is mortality, due to arrhythmias uh, were reduced, but deaths due to shock were increased by exactly the same amount and deaths due to other causes were awash. And so in fact, for every patient we were saving with beta blockers from an arrhythmic death, we were causing another patient to die from uh, a, um, a cardiogenic shock with beta blockers administered in this way. And so this has worked its way now into the recommendations uh, in terms of who gets beta blockers. So oral beta blockers are now recommended with a high level of evidence in patients without early contraindications, and we'll talk about those in a minute. Um, patients with early indications should be evaluated uh, later, so uh, not given immediately, but evaluated later for secondary prevention. Uh, and then uh, IV beta blocker therapy is really reserved for patients who have hypertension uh, without early contraindications and is actually now contraindicated IV beta blockade in patients who have these early contraindications. And what are the early contraindications? Well, some of them are common sense, but some of them are softer than you might have expected. So signs of heart failure or evidence of low output state uh, are obvious. And then those patients who are increased risk for cardiogenic shock, not just in overt cardiogenic shock. So advanced age, uh, relative hypotension or tachycardia, uh, uh, and late presentation with big infarctions. Uh, and then, of course, the ones related to conduction or uh, bronchospastic disease. ACE inhibitors, a large body of data outside of the setting of myocardial infarction. And in the setting of myocardial infarction, uh, a couple of large-scale trials, ISIS-4 and GC-3. Uh, one trial actually showed IV enalapril increased mortality. So IV uh, administration is contraindicated, but a benefit uh, particularly in patients who have LV dysfunction after uh, ST elevation myocardial infarction. Uh, beyond ACE inhibitors, uh, a, a blockade in the, uh, out of the renin-angiotensin system uh, consists of either use of aldosterone or ARBs. Uh, for aldosterone, the Rawls trail, which was not specifically patients with uh, ST elevation myocardial infarction, but was class uh, 3 to 4 heart failure, produced a, a substantial reduction in mortality. Uh, and in the Ephesus trial, a, a plerinone, a selective uh, aldosterone inhibitor, in patients who had an ejection fraction less than 40 percent and heart failure or diabetes, so had to have the combination of LV dysfunction and one of these risks also significantly reduced mortality. Angiotensin receptor blockades have not been as consistently shown to be beneficial. In uh, the optimal trial, mortality trended to be better with captopril rather than Losartan, but in the Valiant trial, there seemed to be no difference in mortality between uh, either of these agents or the combination, so they're considered roughly interchangeable. And so the guidelines are for oral ACE inhibitors with the highest level of recommendation in the first 24 hours, unless patients are in what appear to be uh, early shock or hypotension, um, oral uh, blockers in patients who have uh, smaller infarctions, anterior, uh, who don't have LV dysfunction, ARBs in patients who are intolerant of ACEs and higher risk, uh, IV ACEs is contraindicated due to the early pre precipitation shock, and then long-term aldosterone blockade with a plerinone uh, in patients who have uh, impaired ejection fraction and heart failure or diabetes with the caveat of renal dysfunction being a concern for hyperkalemia. Calcium blockers, I'm not going to show you the data. It's all small. It's all pretty poor, basically. You can give verapamil or diltiazem if beta blockers are ineffective in controlling arrhythmias, and otherwise they're essentially contraindicated. Finally, touching very briefly on uh, complications. 
I'm one who uh, thinks of things in categories, since I'm not very good at uh, remembering different uh, mnemonics for uh, remembering things. And so I would prefer to use, uh, to think of things in terms of the major categories of uh, types of complications. And so you can look at it as, as we have here with the, the major uh, uh, different categories and, uh, of acute myocardial infarction. And most important or most frequent uh, in the setting of myocardial infarction that we see is the development of heart failure, the development of arrhythmias, uh, and then uh, in uh, a, a proportion of patients, recurrent ischemia uh, or recurrent infarction, although this is much less common in the era where we mechanically revascularize patients and we do a catheterization early on than it was in the older days when lysis was routine and patients often didn't have definition of their coronary anatomy and appreciation of how extensive or not extensive their disease was. And so th these are the main contraindications, heart failure and arrhythmia. And then others including pericarditis, right ventricular infarction, the development of mural thrombosis mechanical infarctions occurring in uh, 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 2 to 4 percent of patients uh, or expansion or aneurysm formation. And uh, time doesn't allow me to go into the details of these, but recognizing uh, these uh, and which, what are important is, is the key. Now, uh, an issue that commonly comes up and has been subjected to long-term, uh, long, large trials has been the issue of when is it appropriate to institute hemodynamic monitoring with a swan GANS or a pulmonary artery catheter. And in general, the trials in critically ill patients, both in medical ICUs as well as coronary ICUs, have shown that routine use of swan GANS catheters is not indicated that it does not provide clinical benefit and is associated with the complications, both local access site, uh, both, uh, infection, and rarely pulmonary artery rupture. And so there should be particular indications for use of these rather than routine use in a patient who's uh, 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 sick. And these include severe progressive heart failure that doesn't immediately respond to therapy, suspected mechanical complications of, of VSD, rarely free wall rupture. These patients usually die or need to be taken immediately to the operating room or papillary muscle rupture, uh, overt cardiogenic shock, progressive hypotension, which seems to be uh, uh, progressing to shock and is unresponsive to fluid therapy. Uh, many would uh, argue that the need for uh, prolonged inotropic or vasopressor agents is an indication to understand what the filling pressures are in the cardiac output, uh, and persistent physical signs of hyperperfusion, hypoperfusion, even without heart failure. And the reason uh, these are uh, multiple but very related uh, indications. And the reason is that the Swan-Gantz catheter gives you two key pieces of information that help guide your therapy that uh, uh, actually classify patients. Uh, um, and it's a little out of order, but I'm going to put it here. According to hemodynamic subsets, which really manage your therapy. And those are based upon cardiac output or cardiac index with the Classic dichotomization, somewhere between 1.8 and 2.2 as representing normal or not normal. And then a wedge pressure of greater than or less than 18 millimeters, remembering that 18 millimeters is the point at which hydrostatic pressure exceeds uh, oncotic pressure and therefore there's uh, leakage of fluid into the pulmonary arterioles, uh, alveoli. And so patients can be characterized according to these into patients who are essentially normal, Patients who have an elevated wedge but preserve cardiac output and thus are in pulmonary edema or pulmonary congestion. Patients who have progressed to further deterioration where now cardiac output drops and they have cardiogenic shock. Uh, but also, importantly, and this is uh, patients who not uncommonly present with, in our population of heart, heart patients, is patients who have low output, but it's because of low filling pressures. They become hypovolemic because they haven't eaten and they've got a cardiac catheterization with the osmotic diuresis. Or they have RV failure, so although they may be over, their entire body may be filled, they're not priming their left ventricle. Or they've had venodilation from excessive use of nitrates and other uh, agents. And so, in many cases, patients who appear to be hypovolemic perfused or hypotensive, uh, we don't know the right therapy to give uh, the Swan-Gantz catheter by defining these hemodynamic subsets, uh, the so-called Forrester subsets, will help us uh, define the appropriate therapy. And finally, again, intraoretic balloon pumping is a similar uh, uh, therapy that is beneficial but has been shown to be beneficial only in select subsets of patients. Randomized trials in the early days and also more recently uh, in the days of reperfusion with enteric balloon pumps do not show a benefit uh, with routine use, even in patients with large infarctions. Um, uh, and of course the complications, although getting less with the smaller catheters, continue to be an issue. And so the indications are a hypotension, a cardiogenic shock that isn't a quickly or easily re uh, reversed with pharmacologic therapy, uh, similarly low output states, recurrent ischemia in patients prior to revascularization. There's no overall benefit 
But as a bridge to revascularization, there's a benefit of balloon pumping. In some cases, recurrent, uh, refractory polymorphic VT, generally because of a ischemic substrate, although at times reducing the stretch of the ventricle for, uh, in heart failure can improve things, and refractory pulmonary congestion. The key with balloon pumping is it is used as a bridge uh, and is not, uh, does not change outcome without more definitive therapy. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you.